Welcome to Slight Reliability. Learning SRE one day at a time. I'm Stephen Townsend. Hello and welcome to Slight Reliability. And welcome to the second part in my little mini-series around bad observability. Now in the first session, I talked a little bit about forgetting the customer, only focusing on technical metrics. We also talked about building lots of dashboards that no one ever uses, about inconsistency in your observability across your different environments and the missed opportunity there, and also a little bit about misunderstanding metrics. Now, I do want to point out just before I go any further, there is a, f a conference coming up called OlliFest. And during that conference, I will be talking about bad observability uh, in that, uh, concise but clear fashion so if you're interested in Olifest, check it out it's o one one y f e s t i'll be posting about Olifest closer to the date uh, on twitter and linkedin and i've got links uh, below in the video and in my podcast as well today we're going to continue our discussion about observability anti-patterns with a little bit more focus on culture so Observability anti-pattern number five, tools without culture. The general pattern that I see often in the industry is that we purchase a tool, we install it, and we hope for the best. Now, tool vendors are very good at selling a story about how the tool will do the work for you. That is never the case. A tool can do wonders, but only if you know what the challenges are that you're trying to overcome or the outcome that you're trying to achieve is in advance. And that requires embedding and observability and the value of it into the culture of your team and your organization. But it's not just a fluffy concept of culture we're talking about. Getting a tool and installing it, that's the start line. That's when the work begins. For example, uh, a very common technology these days is a single page at web applications where the URL of every interaction that the customer has is the same. It's a single page app, right? So how do you differentiate in an APM tool or a tracing tool what the customer's doing at any point in time when the URL is always the same? The answer is that we need to instrument the code or annotate the code with metadata so that we can match up, hey, the customer's doing this thing and we can see it in our server-side application-side tooling to get a to diagnose an issue or to see a pattern but that's work right you need to understand the context of the tool and what it's doing to learn about the libraries you're going to need to import and the, the what you're going to have to write into your code to make it work and you also have to really think about the insights you're trying to get for example uh, i work for iag an insurance company we have several quote and buy websites where you can go and get an insurance quote and then choose whether or not you want to purchase that policy. So what kind of metadata might we find valuable, what we want to find out from our customers? For we might want to find out uh, and annotate details about which state the customers are from in Australia or which products they're, they're interested in. Uh, we may also be interested in, at some point, getting the business context of the financial value of the quotes or the, the, the buying, the, the policy purchasing which is going on. So we can track things such as here is our performance and here's how much money we're making and is there a correlation between those two things. Now I'm kind of just making up um, potential examples there, they're just uh, from the top of my head. But you, you get the point right. You need to think about the business and technical information and customer information that you're trying to capture. And I guarantee you that if you install an APM tool or any kind of observability tooling, it's not going to give you that out of the box. It's going to give you a very generalistic, broad set of information. And often it is so broad that it can be misleading or unhelpful. The other thing which I'm going to cover a little bit later on is that if you just install a tool, you're not actually getting people involved in the tool and what it's trying to achieve and feeling like they're part of the process. They don't have autonomy or ownership of it. They're not seeing the value. You kind of want to take them on that journey. So if you impose a tool and say, this is the tool you are going to use for this thing, 
I don't think you're necessarily going to get a very good outcome. So make it part of the culture. Make it part of the way of working. You know, I've heard in the past uh, some organizations say that if your code isn't instrumented, your code isn't complete. You haven't finished delivering this feature unless it's instrumented. I like that. Uh, but that's, that's a huge shift in culture and mindset. Okay, observability anti-pattern number six. And this one I'm going to call out um, Ragu from LinkedIn. He raised this, this point. I, I asked for some if anyone had any good ideas around observability anti-patterns, and he was one of the people who provided an answer. So I, will, I, I can't pronounce his name very well, so what I'll do is I'll link his LinkedIn in the, uh, the video description or in podcast description as well. So Raghu's point was basically around, from my p perspective, not understanding the ecosystem or the business context of the thing which you're trying to put observability into. So in an ideal world, from my perspective, when we're building technology features, we would have vertical feature teams uh, who have, they have the full picture within the team of all the different technology components and the full business component as well. Now, I know that's not the way that things are in uh, maybe most organizations. We have teams who look after a particular component or part of an part of a solution and they not, don't have visibility or ownership of uh, large parts of the full solution and that can cause uh, all kinds of challenges around observability so in that kind of model where you have component teams and they look after part of a technology stack but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's also required it's often common to monitor the health of that particular component but not keep an eye on the downstream components which you depend on and that can be dangerous because the level of service that you provide in that team it depends on these other components so these other teams having a certain level of reliability or performance as well so I think it is absolutely critical that you understand what those dependencies are and track them put observability around them at least Otherwise, you don't know from a full end-to-end uh, -end perspective whether you're providing the level of service you want to or not. From a, a wider context, I think it's important to understand the boundaries of the component or the system that you are looking after, that you are responsible for. Understand, yes, the downstream components and services that you depend on, but who depends on you as well? Understanding that context can help you understand the level of service that you need to provide, which is why I was saying I really think that vertical, complete solution feature teams are probably providing a better outcome at the end of the day because they continually have that full context. The other thing worth mentioning is that if you have services downstream that you depend on in your team, that's when you would typically have SLAs, service level agreements so that you have a certain level of service that, that is agreed that they will provide to you a minimum level of service. And if they can achieve that, then you know that you can meet your objectives at a wider level and to your customers. Some other anti-patterns around not understanding the ecosystem would be, let's say you have a solution with multiple components. Some of them have a high profile. You know, these are the maybe software that we've uh, spent a lot of money on or there's a big team behind. So we put all of our effort and observability around those components, and then we have blind spots with some of these other components, which are dependencies, potentially. That can lead to missing issues uh, and having much slower mean time to recovery because we don't, we've got blind spots, which is never a good outcome. Uh, another example of not having the full ecosystem is only considering workloads of a particular kind or from a particular source. For example, say you have a, an application which has a digital front end and you have customers that interact with it and you put all of your focus on that. But you forget about the fact that you have your own staff, quite a large number of your own staff, using the same system, maybe in a slightly different way during particular hours and not realizing that you need to track specific things to make sure that that business is running okay and you can support that workload as well as the digital workload. And a very common thing I've seen in the past is not thinking enough about batch or asynchronous or out-of-hours processing. 
Not that there is out of hours in 24-7 systems. But if you're going to run a big chunky job, which is going to require a whole lot of processing power, uh, then is that going to impact the customer? Uh, and are you, have you considered that workload or not? And are you monitoring it? Because there are different things that we look at with that batch processing model versus customer interactive uh, observability. One more example would be if you had a rich web application, lots of client-side activity, JavaScript that does stuff in the browser, but all of your observability is on the server side. So maybe APM and infrastructure and platform monitoring, but you have no visibility at all about what's happening in the customer's browsers. And often in a really feature-rich client-side uh, processing type uh, web application, that can take a lot of time and there can be all kinds of issues related to reliability which you will not see if you are only looking at the server side of the monitoring. Observability anti-pattern number seven. I've called this one the chosen few. <laughs> and this is the pattern that I've seen, or anti-pattern, where in any given team, the majority of people are not involved in observability. You'll have one or two sort of senior tech people, usually on the ops side, and they will be the ones who have access to and are actively contributing to the observability. But they're the only ones that look at it. No one else is getting any value out of it. There's no team or organizational culture being built around it. Often the dashboards that get built in this context are indecipherable because they're built for a person for themselves. They're not built in a way which says, my team and the organization are customers, let's build it to tell a story or give them the insight that they are after and that's a huge must opportunity and it goes against everything that we are really trying to achieve with observability it ends up just reinforcing that other anti-pattern which is not observability related where you have teams and organizations who are dependent on a couple of key people and if those people aren't available or they leave then everything falls apart we want to I guess democratize or uh, make observability accessible to everyone. That's when we get better outcomes as teams and as organizations. Observability anti-pattern number eight is kind of similar. It's where you have teams who hoard their monitoring and logging observability data for whatever reason. So let's say there's a big complex end-to-end -end solution and something goes wrong and maybe 10 different teams need to work together now to find the issue. Now, if that data, that monitoring, logging data isn't available to everyone, then you've now created this bottleneck where one particular team, you, you, you're waiting for them to provide uh, their own analysis. And then you start to wonder, well, why are they hiding this data? Are they telling the truth? Are they trying to cover their own ass for whatever reason? It's just, it's a bad sign. I mean, other than logging data, which may have, in some situations, sensitive information or customer information, I understand. But we, need to, we can sanitize that data and still make it available. Apart from that, there's no good reason to be hoarding the data. Make it available to everyone. Make it so that anyone can get to the bottom of an issue and we can get our mean time to recovery faster, our mean time to detection faster, and we're all, as an organization, able to provide a high level of reliability. Hoarding data is not a behavior which is based on good outcomes. Observability anti-pattern number nine, and this will be the last one that I cover today, uh, although I have many more to go. We'll definitely be doing a part three. I've called it data spread, and this is a very common situation where you'll have different teams all over an organization monitoring, logging, tracing, capturing events in different tools, storing that data in different places. When there's an issue or we want to answer a question, how do we find, where do we go, you know, uh, to get that information? And there's a lot of confusion around that. So we have this desire to centralize, to bring it all together, to get the single pane of glass view of everything. And that's really challenging. Now, Although this is a challenge, I think the anti-pattern is the way that we often try and solve that problem, which is we go in and we mandate. 
and we say everyone must use this tool and store their data in this location in this way. Now, the moment that you do that, the teams all over the organization, they lose their autonomy, they lose ownership of their observability, and ultimately, I think that leads to bad outcomes for everyone. Now, I'm not saying that having data spread all over the organization is a good thing. It is a challenge, it's something to be dealt with, but encouraging teams to come up with creative ways to problem solve that is a better way to go, I think, because they'll still have that ownership and investment and they may come up with a solution which you would never have expected before. Mandating, bad. <laughs> Inviting, encouraging, problem solving creatively together, good. So that's all from this episode of Snipe Reliability. I'll be back with more bad observability next week. And thank you for joining me on this journey where we are learning all about site reliability, observability, all of these ideas and concepts uh, together uh, from the start, with a, hopefully with a fresh pair of eyes. And uh, I look forward to the discussions and the comments that come after this. See you next week.